I wish to welcome um, two of our young delegates, um, young in both their studies and also in their ages, um, and they're going to give us a, an opening perspective about what they think is happening in terms of, um, I guess, uh, climate change, adaptation, anything really, and um, at the end of the conference we'll come back and, and tell us what they, they feel after having spent the three days with you. So I welcome Daniela Guitar, who's a recent graduate of an honours degree in environmental science, who uh, looked at uh, the ecology of urban community gardens on the Gold Coast. She moved to Australia from Chile in 2008 and she's actually currently working with NCARF as a research assistant. But her passion is travelling and surfing and next year Daniela will be commencing her PhD. And our second voice of youth, uh, Colette Mortreau, is currently studying her PhD in geography at the University of Melbourne. Um, her thesis is looking at the relationship between adaptive capacity and adaptation, using examples of household response to bushfires. But her past research experience includes working on climate change and migration in Tuvalu. And Colette, Colette is a French Australian and a musician in her spare time. So I welcome Colette and Daniela. Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank CSIRO and NCARF, especially Jean and Sarah, for this unique opportunity. It is a real honour to share my personal views on adaptation to climate change with all of you today. I was born in Chile, and my family has Italian and Spanish background. As you would imagine, everything revolves around food for us. Amazing memories that come to my mind as a young girl in Chile include fishing with dad, picking the fruits in season and making marmalades with mum, and cooking from whatever there was in the garden with my grandmother. Then as I grew older, enjoying the taste of good wine with my family and friends. We have always been connected with our food source, connected with nature, connected with the seasons. But what will this be like in the future? Coming from a family in which food has been such an important thing and having seen the effects of a massive drought on my uncle's farm in Chile, I feel very passionately about the well-being of the earth because it is what our health and well-being depends on. It is where our food comes from, the water we drink, the air we breathe. So we know the climate is changing, we have just experienced the hottest decade recorded in history. Sea levels are rising, glaciers are melting, rainfall patterns are shifting. We're experiencing more and more droughts and the list could go on and on. Water supply and food production are being heavily impacted by all the effects of climate change and will continue to be more severely in the future. It is therefore inevitable to imagine what the world will be like when I'm raising my little ones. So, what was it like for my grandmother? What was it like for my mother? And what will it be like for my children and my grandchildren? Let's think about such a world. By 2050, when rainfall reduction and dry soils will have affected food security in Chile and the world, I'm going to be 60 years old. My children might be in their 30s, and I might even be having grandchildren. Will we still have our traditions? What will we be eating? And where will we be sourcing this food from? We all know we need to adapt to climate change, and we know we need to adapt now. But the context in which we see this is very different. For all of us young people, this is an issue about intergenerational equity that we see from first hand. It is about our future. We're just starting in life. We've had a great childhood, have e listened to the even greater stories from our grandparents and parents, and would like to be able to share this equally with the families we will soon be creating. For the next three days at this conference, we will be talking about information needed to ensure Australia is adapting well to climate change. We will be sharing knowledge and research approaches 
that inform adaptation policy and practice, exploring opportunities and examining limits involved with adaptation. Here in this meeting today, there are over 500 people, including researchers, practitioners and decision makers, who are not only from a very wide range of disciplines, but who are also in very different stages of their lives. This ranges from some of us who are just starting in our careers to others who may be looking at retirement in the near future. Let's all take advantage of this and exchange our ideas amongst different generations, just like we all do amongst our families. Finally, you will see in the program that there are nine different threads, including human health and society, economic and institutional arrangements, and so forth, of which most probably each of you will relate to one of them. I encourage you to think outside your discipline and engage with others, as only that synergy will get us closer to a goal of adaptation. Thank you. Hello, you must be getting a bit restless, I think. I'm the last one, so morning tea is just around the corner. Um, Daniela and I had the chance to run through what we said yesterday and after hearing her talk it made me reflect a bit about my own background and how my life intersects with adaptation, not in an academic way but in an everyday life way. And I thought of my dad, so if you bear with me, um, he lives in France and he's just bought a home um, off the coast of Calais in a marshland, that's right, a marshland. Um, his house is literally surrounded by water. He has to get into a boat to get to his car and needless to say, his house is very vulnerable to flooding. And when he bought this place, I asked him whether he had looked at the flood history. Of course I would, that's the sort of thing I think of. And he produced a map of the last flood and the map was basically all blue. That's the flood water. And I was like, okay. And he said cheerfully that that spot amidst all this blue was his house. Uh, he didn't seem worried about this at all. And he said, if it floods, I'll just put the fridge on stilts. <laughs> and um, my father's no idiot, you know. He used to work as a civil engineer, so he knows about environmental forces and the limits of infrastructure. But when he said this, it sounded pretty ridiculous. Um, but then I asked him why he wanted to move there. And he said that it was beautiful, that it was peaceful. And he could watch the bird life and he'd be part of a small community. And he described it as his pied à terre, which in French is his foot on the earth, like a, a grounding place, a place of his own. And this is a little ironic, I think, um, in that if I ever come to inherit the property, it might not be a foot on the ground, it might be a few <laughs> feet underwater. But nonetheless, it, it makes a bit of sense. And this is my point, really, is we don't always seem to act in rational ways, but there is an underlying logic to most things, if not everything, that we do provided we account for people in all their complexities and our funny things that we do and the things that we value. And this might not make it a wise decision for my dad, but there is some sense to it nonetheless. And I think as researchers and as policymakers, we can undermine and undervalue these kinds of thinking and acting. But if we're really to address adaptation in ways that people can engage with and in ways that are meaningful, we need to respect and accommodate people's values and attitudes. Um, and whilst I'm up here, oh, I've got a microphone and there are a few challenges in adaptation research that I see and I thought I might put them out there. Um, it would be good to see some more empirical evidence, really rich case studies about how communities are responding to climate impacts, to existing uh, social and environmental pressures and also how communities are responding to adaptation, um, keeping in mind that communities may resist adaptation and that adaptations may have adverse outcomes themselves. It would be good to see more learning from other disciplines, and there's been some talk about that today. Um, I think adaptation researchers present adaptation as its own emerging discipline in some ways, and this might be true to an extent given its unique challenges, um, but rather than trying to reinvent the wheel, we'd be well served to look at the work that's been done before us, um, look at disaster risk reduction literature, for example, and there's lots of good things we can learn. 
Um, at a policy level, there seems to be quite a bit of trepidation in delivering policy in the absence of scientific certainty. And clearly, good scientific knowledge is very important. Um, but I think rather than being stalled by the knowledge deficit, we should be asking ourselves how much information is enough to make good adaptation decisions. And I really think the answer is not that much. Um, if we draw on the lessons that we've got from community development and planning, as well as adaptation research and, uh, and other areas, we can make some wise policies now without having to wait for that right bit of information to come along. And I won't go on with this great list. I'm running out of time, I know. Um, but I do hope that in this conference um, we can have some really vigorous discussions and ask some really um, rash, perhaps unpolished, perhaps unsafe questions to push, push ourselves to be thinking outside our comfort zones a little bit because um, that's where really good thinking can occur. Um, so, I, yeah, I'll really leave it there and I'll just say that it looks like there's a, looking through the handbook, some really interesting people here and it'll be good to have a chat, um, have some good discussions, have a chat over a cup of tea and a scone or something. I'm not sure what's on the morning tea list, but I'm sure it's very good. So, I'll leave it there. Thanks. <laughs>